Welcome everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us at Morris Jamel Mansion's virtual parlor chat event. As I uh, said earlier, my name is Megan Burns and I am the programs manager here at Morris Jamel Mansion. Um, tonight, we are delighted uh, to have Professor Manthorne with us to discuss two Elizas in Old New York, Eliza Greaterex picturing Eliza Jumel's mansion. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to visit our house yet in person, um, MJM is the oldest remaining house in all of Manhattan. Um, our house, which you can see on the screen right now, was built in 1765 in today's Washington Heights neighborhood in northern Manhattan. And uh, the house, the inhabitants, and the surrounding area, as you can imagine, have experienced a lot of history and change from that time to the present. Uh, our monthly uh, virtual parlor chat series um, for this, we invite experts like Professor Manthorne to join us for an informal conversation about connections to the house and its history. Um, before I officially introduce her tonight, I just would like to review a little bit of the program's format and Zoom protocols. So, to begin with, um, tonight's uh, Zoom webinar event is being recorded. Uh, some of you who have been on a lot of Zoom calls may have noticed that um, your participant screen looks a little different for a webinar event. Um, so when you enter this room, your microphone and your video should have automatically have been turned off when you enter. Um, however, please note that if you choose to speak in the Q&A, your name will come up, or if you... Uh, raise your virtual hand to be called on and uh, we ask to unmute you, you will be recorded. Um, if you're not comfortable being recorded, uh, you are welcome to exit the meeting. And we will also have a recording of this event available on, on the mansion's YouTube page. Uh, if you decide to remain to, in the meeting or webinar, which we hope you do, uh, you are granting your consent to be recorded. So tonight's program is one hour. Um, our guest speaker is going to speak for approximately 40 minutes and uh, we'll be taking your questions in the Q&A box. So if you look at your screen and you highlight the, um, the Zoom menu bar, you'll see that your three main options are chat, raise hand, and Q&A. So if you have technical comments or questions, you can't see or you know having trouble with the audio, please use the chat on the far left. Um, if you want to virtually raise your hand, which I think some of you have done already, um, we will see that. And when we get to a place, um, we will communicate with you and ask to unmute you. Um, the main way as um, Professor Manthorne is presenting tonight to uh, be part of the conversation during your presentation is through the Q&A. Um, I, myself, um, my, and my colleagues Shiloh and Meg will be uh, monitoring that discussion and we will try to get to as many questions and comments as we can. Um, and then just before we start, I'd like to cordially invite you to the next uh, virtual parlor chat in our series, uh, as well as a few of our other August programs. So next time, um, on August 19th, we will be joined by Professor Timothy Weingard, who will discuss how the mosquito changed the course of the American Revolution. Um, you will be receiving an email at the end of this presentation with information, uh, additional information about Professor Manthorne's lecture, as well as a brief survey and links to uh, register for vir other virtual parlor chats. Um, Next month, we'll also be holding our family day activity, our virtual event on Saturday, uh, August 18th at 1 p.m. And then uh, if you really enjoy art history, architectural history, we encourage you to join us for a special lecture on architecture of the Harlem Renaissance with John Reddick on Sunday, August 9th. So 
we've got lots of exciting things coming up. And of course, please stay in touch with us via our usual social media channels to get more updates on these and other events. So, um, without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's guest speaker. Catherine Manthorne is a professor of art history at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. She is a specialist in American art and culture with attention to the contributions of women. Soon to be published by University of California Press in uh, December 2020, her book, Restless Enterprise, The Art and Life of Eliza Pratt Greatorex, brings back to life this feisty, remarkable figure and her extensive network of art women to shed light on the still misunderstood visual culture of the post-Civil War years. Please join me in welcoming Professor Catherine Van Thorne. Welcome, Professor Van Thorne. Sorry, my headphones just fell out. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight. We're very excited to have you, especially since you were supposed to speak initially in March, I believe. That's right. <laughs> a little thing <laughs> happened. <laughs> yes, just a little thing. Well, good evening, everyone. I really want to thank uh, Shiloh Holly and Megan, who was just introducing me at the Morris Jumel Mansion for inviting me to do this chat, and for all of you uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, so for the next 30 minutes, I want to introduce you to Eliza Pratt Greatorex. While hardly a household name today, uh, in the 1860s and 70s, she was probably the most famous woman artist in America. Oh, sorry. So of the, uh, of the few successful women in the era, um, most painted domestic scenes. So here you're just looking at two of them, two uh, work by Lily Martin Spencer. You can see on the left of your screen, um, it's called domestic happiness. And on the right, uh, the other option for most women was or paintings of flowers. But in the case of Greater X, uh, she charged out into the um, open air and actually painted landscapes and became uh, very much involved in doing a pictorial series of the old New York landmarks being locked to the name of progress. And here you can see the title of her work is the Chaudelet House and she includes this old house. If you can believe this was New York uh, in the, about 1868. So for the, to see New York through her eyes, we need to transport ourselves 150 years ago uh, to, and take a virtual tour around the island of Manhattan as she stopped to sketch picturesque old homes and churches that were still standing around the time of the Civil War. And uh, I don't know if you can see this map very uh, too well, but what we'll be starting down here in uh, lower Manhattan, this is the Battery or the southern end of the island, and you can see all the crisscross lines indicate that it's very uh, densely populated. And we'll be moving all the way up, and if you can see there's a star, uh, let me see if I can diminish this. At the, uh, yes, the upper right part of the island, I put a star. That's the, where the Jumel Mansion is. And you can see that there's very little um, indication here of any kind of population that was still an area that was very much um, out in the open. So as Megan and Will, um, so, sorry. So I guess the question is, Eliza who? I don't know if many people um, listening have even heard of this person, if you haven't um, been directly involved with me and, and uh, listened to me talk about her, but she lived a life few of her female contemporaries could ever have imagined. She doubled as a proper Victorian woman and a precursor to the feminists of the 1970s. She sang in the church choir, she became expert at making butter, and as a widow of limited financial means, she raised four children on her own, including a son who served as a Union soldier in the Civil War. But simultaneously and remarkably, she shaped her career as a, as a, first as a landscape painter, and then she became a graphic artist. And you can see in this image here, she's actually holding, most artists, uh, when they have their portrait done, they're holding a brush or standing at um, their easel. But here you can see she's holding her quill pen, which is what she used to make these drawings of old New York. So unusually for a woman, she focused on landscape and became a, a recognized figure in the Hudson River School. 
but as the Civil War, war boom, building boom, uh, well, just after the war, I should say, led to the demolition of many of New York's churches and residences, she put down her pa paint and brushes and trained herself to work in a pen and ink and to record these buildings for posterity. And we'll be seeing many of these works. Um, she actually recorded over 60 sites. In a mark of esteem, her colleagues, mainly male colleagues, elected her in 1869 as, the, as a a female member, the only living member at the time of the prestigious organization, the National Academy of Design. And you see here, uh, when you were elected to be an associate of the Academy, you were supposed to submit a portrait, either one, you, a self-portrait that you did yourself or one that uh, she hired this artist to do. Uh, so this is the portrait that's in the Academy. She traveled west with her daughters to delineate the Rocky Mountains. And she also helped to found uh, landscape uh, artist colonies in Cragsmore, New York, and in Colorado Springs. She also traveled abroad many, many times. She worked extensively in France, in Germany, and in Italy, and she actually lived for a year in North Africa. After, so this makes her basically the first American woman to establish an international re reputation that is in the hands of the, somebody well-known like Mary Cassatt. So all these efforts were recorded in her paintings, her pen and ink drawings, her heliotypes and etchings. So I have to give myself a little plug. Uh, if you're interested in all, many of her other adventures, uh, please look at the, my forthcoming book. It should be out by December from the University of California Press. But for tonight, I want to share with you her crowning achievement, the pictures that she created over a 10 year period and assembled into her, in her book, uh, it was titled Old New York from the Battery to Bloomingdale that she published in 1875. So let's start, imagine we're starting our tour in Lower Manhattan. This is Union Square, which you see right here, this grassy oval in um, the lower part of your screen. And if you're familiar with New York, this is a place where we used to at least have the um, farmer's market and uh, other um, you know, kinds of political events. But you can see that the lower part of the island is extremely densely uh, built up. And you can see the ships all lined up in along the, um, along the different wharfs uh, of the city. But look here to the right, you see this white uh, building. This was the Church of the Puritans um, designed in 1846 by James Renwick Jr. And you can see that it has perhaps even from this image of rather striking uh, features of the tall uh, towered facade that was inspired by Abbey Saint Denis in um, Paris. Renwick, however, substituted the Gothic, the pointed Gothic towers for with um, rounded arches, making this the first Romanesque uh, church in Manhattan. So this was an extremely, already an extremely important architectural building when, and it became even more famous with its uh, minister, Reverend George Cheever. From its pulpit, Reverend Cheever waged a fierce abolitionist campaign. And so powerful were his sermons that combined religion and abolition that he was actually encouraged courage to publish them in several books, including one called God Against Slavery. But remarkably, this church that was so important historically and architecturally was slated for destruction in 1868. And if you can imagine, this church was going to be knocked down in order to make way for Tiffany and Company's new store. So, Greater X was suitably outraged and learning of this travel, travesty, she mobilized. She headed to the site and made drawings of the church as the wrecking crew removed the furniture from the church and then locked down the building. So this pen and ink drawing that she made, and you can see even the ladder here at the top, uh, this pen and ink drawing uh, is a rare trace of the church's short but distinguished history. At the same time that Greater X was sketching the church in 1868, New Jersey artist Alessandro Mario painted this large canvas. And you can see it presents a very vast cluttered scene of both construction and excavation going on uptown in the East 40s. 
although we don't know much about this artist, uh, we do know that he, clearly he was struck by the post-war housing boom that was going on that he captured in this sweeping panorama. So since it's hard, a little bit hard to, to see the details, I wanted to just show you a couple of close-ups. So first we'll look at this area here. So you can see scaffolding around this building. Uh, if, you've, if you've been in New York, you know scaffolding is nothing new, um, that we see it all the time. And here, of course, this intact church. Um, and in the foreground, we have the telegraph poles and other uh, the, the light fixtures, things that are getting ready for new settlement. And just this is just another detail on the other side of the picture. You can see the, the men using these hand tools like picks, pickaxes and things to remove the debris and drag it away in this horse-drawn carriage. So basically, this was Greater X's New York a city where crowded downtown was being modernized and the open pastoral areas uptown were fast being developed. It was a time of really massive transformation that was euphemistically called by the city fathers the March of Improvement. They always give it a good spin. In reality, however, uh, the revered architectural landmarks were being sacrificed to an expanded grid of long wide thoroughfares like Broadway was being extended they were building new apartment buildings and of course commerce. And then uh, not so far from this site, they were actually constructing um, or destroying a lot of the city to build Grand Central Terminal. So in the days before architectural preservation, um, Greatrix had little hope really that her of stopping this rapacious progress. So she resolved to document the soon to be lost buildings. And as we'll see, the artist had her work cut out for her. Although she created over 80 pictures, uh, she um, and assembled them into the book called Old New York, um, it really never stopped the, the kind of um, progress that was being uh, conducted in the city, changing the face of the whole um, metropolitan underpinning. So anyway, um, I wanted to, I, would, I had hoped to be able to have this book to show you and to turn the pages and to look at it together, but it's um, a rare folio volume that's very large. You can see it's 14 inches uh, this way, 11 inches wide, and uh, here I am just showing it very thick. So it's a bit awkward to try to, to show on a Zoom, but I thought we could imagine ourselves just turning a couple of pages and getting a feel for the book. So of course you always had the, um, the leaf, the initial leaf, um, the decorative page. And then we turn and you can see that each mini chapter in the book focuses on a building site with the picture here and the text uh, for going on for several pages. So this was the format of the book. And then if we turn one more, again, you'll see that protective tissue was inserted between each plate and the text. So this really helped to uh, preserve these images and to ensure that, um, you know, that, that, that they would be uh, kept in good shape. So I think we want to stop here, Megan. Uh, yes. So um, a couple of things. First of all, um, you have uh, many personal acquaintances who are very excited to be here as part of this presentation. Um, Sarah Linda uh, was commenting on your remark a minute ago about New York's own manifest destiny. Um, she's glad to be here mm -hmm. with you tonight. Um, Anne had a question um, earlier about the citation for the Union Square image. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is it possible okay. for you to go back to that or? Oh, sure. And then, um, let's see. Oh, we also wanted uh, to invite everyone tonight. Um, if you'd like to make a donation to Morris Jamal Mansion to help us with our ongoing efforts to sustain educational programming like this. Um, uh, We'd love it if you could help us in that endeavor. Uh, and we'll place some donation information in the chat box. Um, any donation above $25 will be entered to win a gift card from the, music, from the mansion gift shop. So um, just a little plug, uh, but now we wish your book was out, Kathy, so we could offer that as our prize, but we will be sending you more information on that. Um, so we have Union Square, and, um, and uh, who is the artist for this? 
the artist wasn't actually recorded, but I did um, in the material in the uh, additional material that you that you're going to share with people. Mm -hmm. There was a, a link to an exhibition that um, the Museum of the City of New York did a few years ago, oh, okay. called "The Greatest Grid." Mm -hmm. And, and so there, they include highlights of some of the images that were um, that were part of that exhibition. And this is one of those. So all the complete information is there. Great. It's awfully tricky, you know, when you make these uh, PowerPoints to put all the printed, you know, print to put too much print information on top. So it's all there. Great. Okay. And we will be sending a link with um, that information. Fantastic. So Anne, um, we'll also try to put that in the chat for you. Um, and, oh, and Laura says we have a black and white copy of this at the Hudson River Museum. Great. And I believe you spoke there as well. Right. Yep, and my husband in February. The vision there at the, at the Hudson River Museum. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> so fantastic. Well, please keep these comments and questions coming. Um, and I put the information on the gift card raffle in the chat. So please, whenever you're ready, We'll go back to the two Elizas. All right, so shall we re resume our tour of Manhattan? Okay, in 18670. So uh, we traveled uptown then from U Union Square to East 46th Street, and now let's head a little bit 40 further north. Um, I like to think of 57th Street as kind of, um, as Sarah Linda mentioned Manifest Destiny. We think of that idea of the Western frontier as kind of the Mississippi separating um, the more settled part of the country from the wilder frontier. And uh, in a way, in this period, 57th Street was the frontier that separated the more built up area from uh, the more open area that was just starting to um, be developed. So here you can see a few squatters, these different buildings that will soon be pushed out of the way to make room for, uh, for progress. And uh, so this is a photograph there. It's, they're very hard, it's very hard to find many photographs from this period of the um, panoramic views of the city. So that's why I'm mixing photographs with prints. But here's one that I really love. It's hard to believe that this is 59th Street, Broadway and 8th Avenue. Um, you can see the farmhouses, uh, the, the carts being pulled by the horses, lots of open spaces. Um, you know, just think about in 150 years, all the changes that actually uh, took place. It's quite remarkable. But you can imagine Greater Exxon, her studio at the time is at Madison Square. So she's leaving uh, 23rd Street and she sort of heads out. She's, she's a walker, as a lot of people were at the time. So she's walking around the city looking for different uh, sites that she's going to uh, depict. So this uh, is an image of a small photograph called the carte de visite on the left of uh, Greater X's friend, Fidelia Bridges. And if you remember um, at the beginning, I showed you a picture of flowers by her, but here she is. Um, this is the kind of sketching, this is the kind of uh, dress that the women would wear when they went out to paint in the landscape. And we sometimes are, are told and we're led to believe that the women were not really painting landscape, but in fact they were. And you can see Fidelia clearly has had some kind of special suit made that looks almost like um, a slightly military look. And here you can see this is her portable easel uh, here. So she'll go and set that up and, and have a little space to uh, work and put her uh, sketch, um, well, her, not her uh, panel actually. And here she has her umbrella. Uh, so this is the kind, and when she posed in the studio, I love this because she must have had the photographer put this background, this landscape background, um, uh, to sort of set the mood for the fact that she's heading out into the field. So we don't have an image of greater extra uh, dressed to go sketching, but she would have probably had this type of equipment. But as I mentioned, when she gives up painting and she starts doing her sketching, these are the, uh, with pen and ink, this is the kind of thing she would carry. So this is the full item, it's called a penner or an, uh, an inkhorn, and then you can take it apart. These are the different uh, pieces. So we can imagine that the, um, it's designed to carry powdered ink, a quill pen, and fine grain sand that you would have used as a kind of blotting, blotting uh, to blot the image because when you used ink and you know could get kind of messy and you don't want it to uh, smudge. So uh, you, and you can see, so, and we know that she was actually doing this kind of thing because the journalists um, often talked about what she was doing. I mean, it's hard to believe sometimes the kinds of things that were reported in the newspapers, but. They're reporting in the New York Times the things Greater X is doing. And they said, quote, taking her pen, inkhorn, and table into the open field. So in other words, this woman has a public presence. Um, 
and here I'll just show you. Oh, uh, this is another church that she drew, St. George's Chapel, which, um, and she would often re record um, this kind of information. She says, erected in 1749, demolished in 1868. So this, in a way, is kind of gi giving you the shock value of, the, of what is being destroyed at that moment. But if you look closely here, among the material that they've taken out of the church and laid outside to, um, to reserve for perhaps other use, you can see two figures, and I tried to blow those up here. So this is Eliza Greatorex and her sister who offer, often accompanied her on these different um, projects, and she's the one who actually wrote the text for the book. So um, people recognized her. When a building was about to come down, she would show up with her pen and ink and sit down and do, do, make these drawings. So, um, she was kind of a known character. So we could almost, I like to almost think of her as a performance artist, you know, protesting this uh, architectural destruction. But in any case, um, this is another, I, uh, another, just to give you, again, a little bit of the flavor of what some of these places are like. She's walking around looking for different motifs. And this is another farmhouse. This is at 84th and the Bloomingdale Road, which later gets re renamed as Broadway. Uh, but here you can see this is um, another one of her subjects. Um, so you can imagine her on her tracks. She spies the Summer and Dyke House. Uh, and this brought to mind the old tale about, about it. Louis Philippe, Duke de Orléans, and the future King of France spent over three years in America. And there are, of course, many stories repeated about his New World adventures, but perhaps none was more improbable than the fact that they were often said that he resided in New York City. And legend had it that he and his two brothers lived in this house of Tennis Summer and Dyke and taught school. So fascinated by this colorful tale, Greater X made on the spot pen and ink sketches of the exterior of the house in 1868. And as you can see, she shows it kind of tumble down, trees surrounding it. Um, and with a text uh, written by her sister that mentions the fact that the future king um, made these pedagogical efforts. Well, other artists went even further, and I love this image. This is the interior of the Summer and Dyke House uh, that appeared uh, in the, uh, it was a work by Sarony, um, actually showing him teaching the school, ignoring the fact that as he traveled around America, he actually only stayed briefly in New York. But the persistence of this myth seems to have a logic of its own. It seems as though Americans liked the story of this nobleman as teacher, and it really suggests that the, even the future king of France had to find work and struggle to support himself like any other immigrant. So this was um, a favorite story that people told, and you can see that um, Greater X um, is kind of fascinated by this place. But here I just wanted to show you, again, compare this work a work by that same artist who did the interior. Here um, you can see that he's showing the telegraph poles, the light fixtures and other things, the road here, whereas Greater X takes a very different position and uh, this allows her to ignore those what she regarded as technological intrusions in the landscape and to paint it, depict it more as a kind of um, the charm of the quaint old structure that you see here. Anyway, let's head further north. We need to make progress. Um, she, this, she visited Hamilton Grange, the final home of Alexander Hamilton. And of course, these days, it seems like you can't escape um, information and hearing all about Hamilton on the Disney Channel and, um, and all of that. But of course, he was the founding father and first secretary of the treasury. And um, I guess most people might are aware of this, but his house was up, up maybe 20 blocks from the Jumel Mansion, but it had actually moved from its original site. And um, it, it, today it's on uh, 141 and originally stood on 143. But anyway, let's finally get to our, our, st our terminal stop. Uh, here we have Greater X's image of the Roger Jumel Mansion that she did in uh, the 1870s. And I want to show you, this is a, por a portrait that, um, of Madame Jumel is in the center. And she took her two grandchildren to Europe in the 1850s. And um, so Jum Madame Jumel died in 1865. We don't think uh, Greater X and Madame Jumel actually met, met because towards the end of Jumel's life, she was kind of a recluse. But this girl, her granddaughter, married a man named uh, Raymond Perry. And in uh, Greater X's book, she talks about the fact that Raymond Perry was very, hosted her and was very knowledgeable about the history of the house and, and helped her to, um, 
you know, find different motifs on the ground. So, so she, um, that was how she had access to it. So here again, to return to that for a minute, um, at the beginning, Megan uh, mentioned a little bit about the history, but I'll just repeat that it was um, the summer retreat for Colonel Roger Morris and his wife, uh, Mary Phillips. Um, the nephew of a successful architect, Morris was greatly influenced by the Italian arch architect Palladio. So that's why some of these features of this house were actually um, quite startling for New York at the time, uh, the Tuscan columns, and, but especially the, at the rear, the two-story octagonal addition was the first of its kind in America. So it was a very handsome house. But, and then with the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, Morris, the loyalist, left for Britain. And in his absence, the mansion was occupied by a succession of dignitaries. Um, British uh, Lieutenant General Sir Henry Clinton, the Hessian commander, von Knipphausen, and of course, most famously, George Washington, who used it as his temporary quarters from September to October 1776. After the war then, the American government confiscated the property, which became Calumet Hall that was a popular tavern. And then uh, in 1810, Stephen and Eliza Jumel purchased it. And certainly Eliza Jumel was the most colorful proprietor whose home Greater X would portray. And I think significantly, uh, one that belonged to a wealthy and successful woman. So sadly, as we've seen, um, the subjects that Greater X depicted are gone. So the Jumel Mansion offers us a rare opportunity to actually think about what the house looked like versus the way Greater X actually depicted it. And this really helps us to understand her approach. So I would say that this is probably the kind of classical view of the house it gives you from down the hill, uh, looking up at it and um, straight on. So you can see the Palladian features very caref very uh, strikingly. But Greater X, by contrast, seems to go halfway down the hill and look at it with trees, uh, including all these different trees in the way, where it appears smaller and a little bit less impressive with all this vegetation. So we start to think to ourselves, why did she do that? Um, but in plate after plate, if you start turning the pages of this book, uh, the motif of the stand of trees appears almost without exception, uh, situated between the building itself and um, the viewer. So it suggests, of course, that she's doing this on purpose. And why? I, I'm, I think that it functions as a kind of time portal, that looking through the trees, the viewer is transported, uh, metaphorically, of course, from the modernized present to the pre-technological past to a time uh, when her crumbling structures were throbbing with life. And of course, this idea of the conceit of the trees as a symbol of an earlier idealized time is a staple of American nature writing. You can find it in Thoreau, you can find it in William Cullen Bryant. But I think significantly, again, I found interesting parallels with uh, Susan Fenimore Cooper, the daughter of James Fenimore Cooper, who wrote a very a pioneering book called Rural Hours in 1851, where she too uh, deals with this idea of um, the trees as being, uh, looking through the trees, this arboreal curtain to, and calling attention to the cycles of history. So I just wanted to show you a few more images here of this. Um, so uh, Greater X then spent a lot of time surveying the grounds. It, it, there was a lot more property then than there is now uh, belonging to the house. And she's pondering not only the parade of historic figures that across the threshold, but she's always very attentive to the idea that objects in nature were ancient. And here she lived, as you can see, um, some historic trees um, beside the Jumel uh, house. Or here's another example where, where she was fascinated by the idea that she goes into the arbor, Madame Jumel's arbor, and then she sees uh, Washington's landmark. And as she writes at the bottom of the drawing, Washington used to tie his horse to this tree. In 1874, the storm took the top down. So again, she's emphasizing this idea that trees, houses, everyday objects, um, all these things really speak to her. So she's advocating for the preservation of these objects in what today we would call a house museum. And in fact, in several of the different entries in her book, she mentions this idea that this would make a, an ideal museum. So I know she would have been thrilled that eventually the Daughters of American Revolution helped turn the Jumel Mansion into a museum that we can enjoy today. So I just wanted to um, sum up them with some final thoughts. Um, and these are the three that I would mention. One, that as New York experienced massive growth and in industrialization following the Civil War, 
many of its residents retreated, oh, sorry, many of its re resident artists retreated into nature. That is, you know, they're looking for some still untouched wilderness or some nostalgic pastoral. But Greater X, by contrast, confronted the relentless transformation spearheaded by Boss Tweed and tried to reckon with a changing city. Second, uh, what appeared to be modest images of individual homes and churches were born of an enormous outrage. She couldn't believe the city's historic amnesia. Her father was a, was a minister, was um, a Methodist minister, and she came from Ireland where there was a great sense of history. So she was really shocked by her adopted country. But three, for old New York, uh, she adopts the role of the pictorial historian. The 80 images that she created and assembled in her book then constitute her cumulative evidence of New York's soon to be lost past. Greater X's curiosity, her morality, and her conviction in her personal mission took precedence over consideration. She never worried so much about public taste, like what will sell, what won't sell. She was just really um, focused on this project. Um, it received very highly positive reviews from the critics and did sell, but it was a self-funded project that was extremely expensive. And it ultimately, it bankrupted her, forcing her to sell all her worldly goods and abandon New York. But never one to feel sorry for herself. She reinvented herself once more and went on to new endeavors. But that is a story for another evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. She's just such a fascinating figure. And um, like many in our audience, including Alan, uh, who has a question, you know, given, given her professional affiliations and her artistic status, why did she remain only a footnote in art history? And was she with the New York Etching Club? She was part of the, uh, I'll start with the second question first. She was part of the um, etching revivals. Um, there was a man named Sylvester Kohler who um, mounted two very important exhibitions. He was the first um, curator of prints at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And he felt you know, very strongly that prints needed to have much more presence. So he organized one exhibition in 1881. And she was one of the, um, she was considered one of the pioneer women in that show. Um, he, he gave her a lot of, um, you know, space in the show. And then in 1888, there was another show and she was, um, had even more work in there. So she was part of that, but she w wasn't actually a member of the etching club because uh, she was living by that time in Europe. Mm. But I mean, I think, you know, a lot, I think there's a lot of question about what happened to um, different artists reputations, how, um, you know, how they rise and fall. But I think one of the things that strikes me about um, it's, you know, we don't really need to, you know, beat the gender issue too much, I don't think. I think it's partly also that, um, that there was this period after the Civil War, the 1860s and 1870s, that had a very unique character um, in, the, in the artwork. And then by the 80s and 90s, when we get move into the Gilded Age, I think that style kind of overtook. Um, you know, you had Augustus St. Gaudens and you had the American Impressionist and that style kind of took over it. And, and a lot of the people who were um, in that earlier period, I think were um, left aside. So it, it's, it is tricky, um, you know, the vicissitudes of art history and, the, and, and what happens to people's reputations. Mm. Um, so uh, in the chat, a lot of uh, praise rolling in for uh, from Sarah Linda for this window into a woman and a specific time. Can't wait for the next chapter. Um, let's see. Janet loves the term a boreal curtain. I also do. Um, and Anne was wondering if Greater X knew Jeanette Loop who painted the portrait of another Eliza, Eliza Treadwell at the Merchant's House. Loop and her husband were also members of the NAD. So that's the National Academy of Design. Right. Uh, I haven't run across that name. In this book, I, I try to develop a lot of her uh, Greater X's female networks. And one of her best friends was a woman named uh, Mary Louise Booth. And Mary Louise Booth was the cousin of uh, Edwin Booth. And, uh, but, she, but um, you know, so that's, that's always mentioned as an identifying thing, but in her own day, Mary Louise Booth was like one of the big movers and shakers. And she was um, the founding editor of Harper's Bazaar. And so she was one of the people that, um, she would have a salon every weekend. Great, and, and, and that was one of the places where women could really hobnob with other people. And so I'm sure that, it, um, you know, all these people met, I just, 
uh, Greater X was a, a terrible letter writer. She didn't really, um, wasn't a good correspondent. So it was How time frustrating to, for you. Yeah. It was <laughs> trying to hard research. To, hard to, um, you know, connect the doll, the dots in terms of who she was friendly with. But um, I think, I mean, it's weird to say, but New York was a small town in those days. And so I'm, I think everybody knew each other. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so let's see, um, we've got some questions about, uh, f uh, specifically from Eve, would Kathy tell us about her heroic years of effort tracking down the scattered records of Eliza and her children? <laughs> okay, well, that was, it's been a long journey for people who know me. I've, I've um, off and on been working on this for uh, almost two decades. So, mm -hmm. um, so, it, so it was very frustrating because with a lot of women, you, you uh, tend to have uh, diaries or letters or, you know, more private type of documents. But in her case, uh, she didn't have any of those things. Um, well, I mean, I found a letter here and there, of course, but um, the main way I ended up tracking her was in the press. And it was so wonderful because I would, you know, I just, filled whole notebooks with um, the New York Times and the Brooklyn Eagle and all these different uh, magazines that would talk about what what she was doing. So she was a, a watched artist at that time. And, and that was one of the ways I found her. But then over time, um, my husband, James McElhenney and I, we traveled to many different uh, places that Eliza went. So we went to, she went to Colorado, we went to Colorado, she went to um, all the, and even recently, just as my book was going to press, I still had not found her grave, which, you know, of course, you can go to press without the grave, but, <laughs> but um, you know, you just want to know, like, you just want to put the uh, lid on the coffin. And so we went to France, and even there, we couldn't find the, uh, the grave at first. But then after we got back, these people um, trekked around for us and found her grave. It was in Moray sur Long. So I finally was able to say, okay, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing how you, you know, the longer you spend time researching a historic figure, you start to feel like you know them. I know that's um, true. And that you're really connected with them. Because I used to work at the Tenement Museum as well. And it's like you, you ha are emotionally invested in, in their lives and the places and the things that they did. Um, so let's, uh, I believe Helen has a question about her last name. Greater X is an unusual last name. Uh, do you have any sense of where the family originated? Yes. Okay. So, um, her own family name was Pratt, P-R-A-T-T, -T, oh. and she came from Ireland. And so that's what, it's, it's, it's very confusing, but um, and then she married a man, I didn't even go into this, but, um, but she married a main, man named Henry Greatorex, and Greatorex was British. And he, he came from a very distinguished family of musicians. He wrote a book of, of, of church compositions. He came to this country, but his, his father was actually um, a very famous musician in Britain, and, in his, and his grandfather was a musician and, and a mathematician buried in Westminster Abbey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so the, they came from this very distinguished uh, line of, and I think it was originally spelled slightly differently, greater X, um, but, um, that, but I have to say, even though the name is quite a mouthful, I was very lucky that she married Henry <laughs> greater X, yes. because um, if her name had been Pratt, I never would have found her. There are so many Pratts, but uh, greater X was unusual, so I was able to <laughs> find her. Yes. And that also speaks to some of the challenges of trying to trace women's history because once they they marry and adopt, you know, their husband's surname or sometimes as just, you know, Mrs. Edward so and so, it gets very challenging to find them. So well, um, yeah. Uh, so Anne has a question. Um, did Eliza Greater X, didn't she paint the interiors of the Dakota, the famous apartment building? Okay, that was, I didn't, the other, I mean, there was, in a half an hour, there was so little time. So uh, she had two daughters who were also artists, um, Kathleen Honora Greatorex and um, her, other, her other daughter, um, uh, Elizabeth. So, um, so, so the, the, two, the two daughters were actually the ones who uh, painted uh, the, they painted what was called then the, like the public powder room of the Dakotas. They mm -hmm. originally on the first floor, there would be public spaces. So people came in and they would, you know, could go to the ladies room and freshen up and whatever. Uh, so in my book, I have a whole description of the way the Dakota, you know, what um, the kind of work that they did there, but they were actually um, involved in doing a lot of domestic um, mural decoration. They did some out west, they did some in Paris, um, but, but the, the, and I was never really able, sadly, to find much um, 
well, shall I say, I wasn't able to really gain access to the, to the Dakota building to really find out. I mean, I imagine that they've been painted over, but perhaps um, if someone were willing, you'd be able to find these things underneath. I don't know, you know, to do um, some kind of conservation and excavation. <laughs> Well, it seems that you've sparked a newfound love of Eliza Greatorex. So, uh, <laughs> you never uh, know. <laughs> uh, Gail wants uh, to ask, well, she said, shares, what a sublime lecture, an exhibition of the drawings paired with writings from her new book, uh, your new book, would be wonderful. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, I believe. Uh, said, thank you for these virtual events. It helps give us a sense of normalcy to these trying times we're all living in. Uh, thank you very much, Ivelisse. That's one of the things um, that we really wanted to do both with this um, virtual parlor chat series and other events like our virtual family days and um, uh, it, your comments very appreciated. Thank you. Um, oh, Janet wants to know, would you call Greater Rex a romantic artist, given her arboreal curtain? I think, um, well, I like to think of her as having like one foot in realism and one foot in romanticism, because um, she would always talk about the fact that um, I have to go back to the to the site that I drew and I had to make sure that my drawing is correct. And she was always talking about this, which always kind of tickled me, because at the end of the day, when you really can find another image of the motif that, it, you know, her, hers were more romantic than realistic, but, um, but she talks about um, that struggle. And I think, you know, so many of the artists like Thomas Cole and, and Frederick Church, um, they all kind of had to um, cro sort of straddle that line because people didn't want totally romantic things and they didn't want totally realistic things in America. They liked, I think they, that, that kind of um, blend was what they most, um, you know, went after. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have to go as an artist, you have to go and try to make a living too. So if you're painting things that don't sell, it gets tricky. <laughs> I, well, I should say she and her daughters were very enterprising. Um, they always taught, you know, art classes, just like artists mm -hmm. today. A lot of times they teach at the Art Student League. Where they're teaching all over. Um, the, the Greater X women all did that too. They had classes all the time. Um, one of the daughters, um, Eleanor, she, Eleanor Elizabeth, she was the one who always wrote articles for newspapers and, and magazines. Um, you know, they were always trying different strategies to try to, mm -hmm. she even made um, some of the early, they would make wedding albums um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1860s and 70s. And, and, and she would um, make these things for, um, you know, for different brides. So they were, you know, they tried to keep their head above water in so many ways. I mean, it was really kind of touching and yeah. fascinating, you know. They all seem like um, enterprising women who were ahead of their time. <laughs> um, Anne has a question about her original book. Where is her original book housed? And I actually have a question for you because you, you have a personal copy of, of the book uh, itself. Um, how did you come across uh, this original find? Well, there are copies in some of the, you know, for example, the daughters gave, um, you know, gave some of her prints to the Library of Congress, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and then she had another person who collected her work named Emmett, and he gave things to the New York Public Library. So, so, so um, there are copies around, but I actually found one, one at, um, on A, A Books, you know, the, just, I just happened to find it. Um, I also, there, you know, there are other shops that will come across these, you know, that, that have these things. And, um, so you can find them occasionally, but I should mention also that we didn't really get a chance to talk about this, but these large books, they were originally published in installments. So you would get, they would, they would be, a it would actually came in 10 different parts. So she would release them um, one at a time and they would be uh, packaged in these wrappers. And then once you or anybody else had all 10 of them, then you could have your choice of having them bound in different ways. Oh. So you'll, you'll see like different um, versions have different um, types of leather, you know, more, some are more expensive than others. And also some of them are incomplete because some people, for whatever reason, didn't get their whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually we have another question based on the book of how were her drawings reproduced for the book to sort of be more mass produced in that, that fashion? Do you? Yeah, so she, 
um, so, so what happened was she, she would do the pen and ink drawings. And then originally she was going to, she just, just tried to do a, a, a version. She hired the photographer, Saroni, to actually photograph them and to make a book where each of the pages, you know, would be photographed. But that was incredibly um, labor intensive and also very expensive. Okay. And so then she decided, uh, uh, Munich was the center of art publishing at the time and art reproduction. So she and her and her sister and her children uh, tutored off to Germany and um, had a chance to work in Munich with a man named Joseph Albert. And he at the time was doing the cutting edge um, kind of reproductions of images. So she had them reproduced in this process called the heliotype. So it's basically a photomechanical process that she's using to, to reproduce these. And then they're inserted uh, into the book or um, she also kept some aside. I found a, a document, a contract where she kept some aside. So say if her friend Mary Louise Booth was writing her book on the history of New York, maybe she would like a, a picture of the Jew Mound Mansion to put in her book. She could have um, those versions to be inserted in other people's work. So it was quite a production. I mean, yeah. it was, you know, wow. <laughs> it was really um, a wild scene. <laughs> um, so we are, we have about five minutes left. And of course the comments keep rolling in because again, people are inspired now. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, David is curious about whether or not she was influenced uh, by proto-preservationists, at least in spirit in say Paris where Edouard Baldus photographed and Charles Marion obsessively etched medieval Paris before it was raised to the ground. Well, I, I'm glad David asked that question because uh, I did have a whole section in my talk about, um, about Paris and then I took it out because it was just, it was getting to be too much. But yes, she was in Paris um, in 1867 um, for the, um, you know, the big exposition, but she had been there also in the 1850s. So between, in that, between that time, Haussmann and all the uh, different changes that were going on in Paris, destroying the old city and the artists who did um, work to record record that. She was aware of all that. She would have known, you know, she would have been struck by the major changes that had happened in the intervening time between the, her first and second visit. So she's definitely aware of Paris and um, aware of these examples. And I think that helped inspire her to, uh, you know, to do what she was doing in New York. Um, great. Kathleen, given your point about having to cut out the section of your talk about Paris, uh, wants to know, uh, will you be giving any more talks about this uh, topic? There seems like there's so much more interesting stuff to learn, indeed. <laughs> I, hope so, yeah. I mean, each, I mean, it's nine chapters and each one almost covers a different, you know, adventure of her life, um, mm -hmm. including her time in Ireland, her time in Germany. Um, she lived for a summer in Oberammergau and went to the Passion Play and did a book about that. So, wow. you know, it's, so I, I hope to be able to, um, you know, and sort of reach different audiences with some of this material because it's it's really uh, you know and especially because it's 2020 so it's mm. the year of the uh, anniversary of the of the 19th amendment it's really a moment I think when women are are getting a little bit more attention absolutely and that kind of goes back to a question that I had for you which was do we have any sense of whether or not um, Eliza Greatorex and her daughters were involved in social reform. I mean, were they supporters of suffrage? Do you have any evidence that they were active in those yeah, ways? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I should have said um, she was certainly friendly with uh, Susan B. Anthony was a good friend of hers. Um, she actually, I have a documentation that she was at Susan B. Anthony's 50th birthday and gave her one of her drawings from old New York. Um, she was also at some of the different rallies. Um, Emily Faithful was another famous um, suffrage um, women's rights person who from Britain. And we know that Eliza was on the stage with her when she spoke. But there were also other like art groups like the Ladies Art Association. And um, so, so they talked about the fact that um, even if an art, even if a woman can't always uh, be campaigning that their example as professional women was what what was important so I think that was another way that she just helped um, other women to find ways to get art education and things like that so so she did what she could but you know raising four children and keeping your head above water it's a lot but but she, <laughs> but she was very involved with the with with these um women's rights issues yeah and she was a, actually she was the woman um from new york who organized um the all the new york women to be at the uh, in the women's pavilion at um in at the centennial in philadelphia 
she oh. spearheaded all the women artists in New York to, um, to show their work there. We'll have to talk offline more about that because now you've really piqued my interest. Um, so in the essence of time, um, I'm just going to ask um, one more question. Um, we'll also do our best to collect any of the questions from the chat um, and answer them afterwards. You'll also be receiving um, an email containing a link to uh, Professor Manthorne's upcoming book on Eliza Greater X called Re uh, Restless Enterprise. And um, for those of you who have really enjoyed uh, this evening, we've enjoyed having you in our virtual parlor. Um, and we encourage you, if you are able to donate what you can by texting MJM to 44321 or by visiting um, morsejumel.org slash donate. And again, any donation above $25 will be entered to win a gift, gift card to the Mansion Gift Shop. Shout out for Philadelphia, says Janet. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, so our last question um, is from, I believe it is Sue. Yes. Did her views of Colorado gain much attention? Because you talked about her going out west. Right. So she went out to Colorado in 1873, and she was actually sponsored um, by uh, this man, Colonel Palmer, and, and uh, who, who was developing this area, building the railroad and developing it as a health spa, the Colorado mm. Springs area. So they had actually also um, encouraged this other woman, Grace Greenwood, who was a very well-known writer and journalist, to go, to go out there. So they're encouraging these women to come out, and Greenwood is writing about it. Greater X does all these images, and um, it did seem to get quite a bit of, of press at the time um, and and she so she tootles around um, this whole the whole the whole area doing illustrations traveling on the railroad going down into mines um, she writes a whole um, story about that so um, from what we can tell it was um, a kind of boosterism you know but yeah. a, a lot of the artists were were involved with this um, you know Homer Thomas Moran a lot of the different male artists too were involved in um, the you know the development of tourism and promotion so Mm -hmm. oh. and, and I even think more recently of, of Georgia O'Keeffe going to Hawaii for yeah. Dole and, you know, that, that kind of is a, a thread um, for some artists in their work. Um, well, I, I dare say that we will, if you can find time to accommodate, um, Kathy, we will have to have you back for more yep. of the life yeah. and adventures of Eliza Greater X. Um, Bruce is looking forward to reading your book. Eve said that was fascinating in all caps. Thank you. And I would like to thank you so much, Kathy, for, um, for joining us this evening, for sharing your enthusiasm and knowledge. And I also would like to thank all of our participants in the audience. And again, um, a special thanks to those who had some technical difficulties getting in the room. Um, we apologize about that, but we're glad that you're with us now. And um, we hope to see you again at future online and on-site events at Morris Jumel. Thank you, Mary. Megan. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.